Well, good morning. morning. Again. It's funny how the Lord has this perfect timing, and there are lots of things that we don't have control over. But the interesting thing is today we're going to be going over the plight and the taking of Dinah, which you might be aware of. So before we do that, I'll, I'll tell you that there's a lot of really difficult stuff in this chapter, and it's rather confusing. But hopefully we'll be able to make some sense out of it. So let's pray. Father, this morning we need your help as we go through some difficult passages, as we talk about a sexual assault, we talk about murder and deceit, and I pray that you might help us, Lord, to understand what it is that you'd have us to think and to do about this, how we would apply this to our lives, shortcomings that we see in others that we might be able to avoid. I pray that you might help us, Lord, as we go through this, that you would minister to each one of our hearts. I know, Lord, that there are folks here that have experienced sexual trauma, And I pray that you might help us, Lord, as we look at this, that you might bring healing and wholeness and and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to look at the the taking of Dinah. Now, most commentators will call this the rape of Dinah. Uh, In Hebrew, there is no word for rape. So I've omitted that, but this is the taking of Dinah, the only daughter of Leah and Jacob. At least that's mentioned. And so... As we look at this, if you remember where we've been, we've been looking at the life of Jacob. Last week we saw Esau coming up over the hill and meeting with Jacob after 20 years of being separated. He worked seven years for one wife, seven years for another wife, got some handmaids in the middle of all that and ended up having a a whole competition as to who could make more children. It's more like something you'd find on a stud farm Uh, than you would in the Bible. And finally, he has to go home. He separates from Laban, and it's kind of like going from the the fire to the frying pan because he has to face Esau. Esau's coming with 400 men up over the hill, and he sees him coming. And suddenly he had a plan where he was putting all the women and children out first in case he came after him and was going to kill him. He could get away and He separated them into two camps, and if he goes after this camp, I'll get away with this one, and if he goes after this one, I'll get away with this one. But when it came down to it, after he had wrestled with God all night, the next day, when he sees Esau coming, he cuts through all of the children and the women who he put in the front, and he goes up front, which is where he belonged, because he spent time with God. And he goes and he sees Esau, he bows seven times as he goes up, And Esau's heart is changed. Esau doesn't want to kill him anymore, and aren't you glad? Because that would have made the story really, really different with the coming of Jesus Christ. And so he says, who are are all of these that are with you? And he says, well, these these are the children. He doesn't introduce the wives. These are the children that the Lord has graciously given me. So he's giving God glory for all the things that he has. And as he in, they introduced, they're getting introduced to Uncle, um, Uncle Esau, they all bow as well. And we see that he asks, what, what are all these gifts, you know, these, these droves that are before me? And he goes, well, those are gifts and hope that you will find mercy, you'll find grace. In other words, that you won't kill me. It's a bribe. And he goes, well, you can keep it. I don't need it. I've got lots. And he goes, no, really, I'd like you to have it. And he goes, okay. We talked about what a blessing it is to be a good receiver, not just a good giver. And the receiving is almost as important as the giving. So we looked at that. And Esau says, well, come with me. You know, you come to Seir. Come take a look at my house. I'll show you around. And he goes, no, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> I got, uh, you know, I've got flocks and I've got children and they're going to fall out if, if we go too fast. So you and your 400 men just go. And he goes, oh, well, then I'll, I'll just leave some men. And he goes, nope, there's really no need. I'll follow at my pace and I'll take my time and, you know, I'll meet you there. He has no plans of meeting him there. As soon as he goes southwest and he's out of eye shot, he goes northeast and goes in the opposite direction. 
And so he's trying to tell him, I don't need anybody. Take your time. That's because he wants to go in a completely different direction. Because if you remember where God's called him to go is back to Bethel, the house of God where God met him initially. That's where he's supposed to go. And so he's not going to listen to his brother and he doesn't quite trust him at this point for good reason. And he has to go his own way, but he, did, he wasn't honest about it. He probably should have just been honest, right? And so what he does is he takes a, a little bit of a turn and he stops 50 miles short of being where God told him to go. You know what that's like? Just, God told me to do this. Well, I'll just, this will be good enough. And sometimes we settle for the good enough instead of the right thing where God's told us to go. And that's going to open up all of this sort of a problem. He ends up building a house. He wasn't supposed to build a house. He settled down. He wasn't supposed to settle down. And he makes himself very comfortable. And he's right outside of Shechem, which is a town named after a prince. The, the young prince's name is Shechem. And so that's how it got its name. It's an interesting thing. He's just 50 miles away from where God told him to go. But that's going to cause a big problem. He sets up an altar to God and he calls it the God of Israel. God, the God of Israel, El Elohi Israel. And so he sets up this thing and he makes a declaration to all the people in Shechem. This is, I'm, I'm calling on my God. I'm a, I, I, this is my testimony. This is who I am. This is my identity. And he sets this thing up for everybody in the town to see which is, which is good. You know, if you're a Christian, people should know that, right? If it's a secret and people don't know that you're a Christian, you got to wonder what's up with that to put it in the simplest terms. So this week we're going to look at the taking of Dinah. So it turns out that Dinah was the daughter of Leah. It's interesting that they mention her as the daughter of Leah instead of Jacob, but it's because she's female and she's attached to her mom. Now, Dina, I'm sorry, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. It says that she goes alone. And she's going to go into Shechem. How many of you think that's a good idea? And it says specifically, she's going out to meet the daughters of the land. It's her curiosity and her desire to make connections with other girls and that's the given motive as to why she's going. I can understand what it's like to live with a house full of boys and a house full of mothers. We don't know if she's doing this out of rebellion. We don't know if she has a secret rendezvous. She doesn't seem to be escorted by anyone. She doesn't ask permission. Dad doesn't know where she is. Mom doesn't know where she is. None of her brothers are with her. There are no servants with her. She's going alone into a strange place, into a pagan town by herself. Well, you guys see this all the time, right? So she went there to see the daughters of the land. What, perhaps fashion choices. Are they still wearing ripped jeans in the knee? You know, what's the color of, the, of this season? But she's unescorted and she's between 13 and 15 years old. By the way, they would marry as early as 11. I wouldn't advise it. But between 13 and 15, after puberty, it's, it's uh, open game. 13 to 15 years old in a pagan town looking for friends apart from her family, her mothers and her brothers. How many of you see this as a recipe for disaster? Absolutely. So, so why is she alone and why did she come here? The reason that they're there is because Jacob didn't do what God told him to do. They're in a town they shouldn't be in. They're settling into a place where they shouldn't settle. They're in a bad part of town and it doesn't seem to matter to Jacob. And that he's fallen short to doing exactly what God's told him to do doesn't seem to bother him. And he settles down for about eight years, by the way. So there's eight years of time encapsulated between these two chapters. So she decides she's going to go out and see what's going on. You guys see this all the time, don't you? You can go to any mall and find 
girls between 13 and 15, sometimes alone, unescorted, no parents. If you find boys, they're usually in a pack. They tend to gravitate to magnetism thing. I think it's safety in numbers, but then they're always doing silly things. You know, they're smacking each other, tripping each other, tying shoes together, saying foul things from floor to floor. You've seen it all, right? But she's a young girl. Like so many young girls going out to the mall and being dropped off by their parents completely alone and vulnerable. She doesn't see it that way, but it's true. And then when Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hittite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. Now, most commentators explain this as Dinah being raped. It's interesting that Dinah is silent in this entire chapter. It's interesting that God is not mentioned at all in this entire chapter. There is no one praying. There's no one seeking God. There's no any of that. There's no spirituality anywhere in this entire chapter. And the wording of this is one of those things that makes you wonder. And I actually did a word-for-word -word study on all of this. And it means that he took her, much like Abimelech did to Sarah. He took her into his home. But it doesn't necessarily mean that she was violated just yet. And it says that he lay with her. It's not he didn't lay with her. He laid her. That's actually what it says. To lay with someone mentions consensual agreement. So there's a hint that this may have been against her will. And then the third thing is he violated her. Before God, a woman who was either taken or influenced into a sexual relationship with someone who is not her husband has been violated. And it doesn't matter whether she was consensual or not. It is a violation of her being. So you have all the girls that probably were interested in Shechem. He's the handsome prince of the land. And out of all the women in all the land, he spies Dinah. First time in town? Yeah. By yourself? Uh-huh. There's a way of avoiding problems. This isn't one. And a smooth-talking, charming young man shows up who also is connected. In fact, the town is named after him. He could have pulled up in a Rolls Royce today. It would have been the same thing. And, of course, he's charming. And he's interested in her. And so he charms her. <clears throat> and I imagine that he's very... I don't know if you look around, but there are a lot of people with uh, PDA. These displays of affection. And young people tend to not care who's watching, right? Any of you go to high school? Any of you? Any, any of you? Because it, it, it's like nearly pornographic what goes on up against lockers in a high school, if you've been there. And it's, it's, it's uncomfortable as an adult to, to look at. It's like, oh, oh my goodness. But it, it's embarrassing. But there are some people that just don't care, right? I imagine some of that was going on. I imagine a young girl being recognized and being found interesting is one of those things that she found attractive about him, is that he found her attractive. And it's interesting how people can be manipulated. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 15 to 18 says, And what accord is Christ with Balal? And what part as a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We are not called to have fellowship with the world, are we? We're called to witness to the world. This is where we have fellowship. 
that says we're not to have any part with the deeds of darkness that are outside of this place. She's looking for fellowship in the wrong place. And there are lots of people who look for, you know, Mr. Right in the wrong place. Amen? His soul was strongly attacked, attracted to Dinah and the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. And so Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying, give me this young woman as a wife. It's one heck of a way to talk to your father. So you get the idea he's pouring it on thick. He's strangely attracted to this woman. Although it's not so strange for a young man to be attracted to a young woman, right? And they tend to change them fairly quickly. You could throw that word love around a whole lot, right? I love you. I love my car. I love my shoes. I love 70 degrees on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, you can love everything. I get it. You get a young man who's passionate, who's carried away, and who's overwhelmed with her. And he demands of his father, get me this woman. It's like, uh, what is, what is, you know, if Santa had a list, that would be, I want the woman. Uh, get me the woman. Really? And this is how he talks to the king. Interesting. Sounds like a spoiled brat to me. How about you? I think the prince has a problem. I see a young man who gets what he wants when he wants it in a timely fashion, and he knows how to use his words to manipulate a person he just met. Men tend to use love to get sex, and women use sex to get love. It's a proven fact. Women want to be loved, and so they're willing to give something that they feel reticent and uncomfortable giving because they want to be loved. And without which, I thought you loved me. Well, I kind of, I do, but I don't, I don't, I, oh, yeah, I thought you loved me. There are guys that will use a guilt trip like that on women. And so they'll be willing to give something up like that to get love. When Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has loved us to the end and has given his life for us, and that is more than any other man on the face of the planet will ever do for you. Amen. And when Jesus fills that spot, you won't walk around with a big empty vessel looking to get it filled with something that will never fill it. So Shechem is an entitled prince who is spoiled. He's lustful, he's aggressive, and he's a very passionate youth. So it might be like your neighbor or somebody you know, or somebody you're related to. And Jacob had heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with the livestock in the field, and so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. There's family dysfunction everywhere. First of all, he gets wind that this young man has sexually assaulted his daughter. He does nothing. He waits for his sons to come back from the field. I'm sorry, when do your kids make decisions for you? I would attest that there is a lack of leadership in this man. He does not seek the Lord. He doesn't build a t an altar and call on God. He doesn't see this as something he needs to consult with God about. He's going to consult his sons. Not a good idea. Right? At least in my opinion. And so who's the one who initiates contact? It's the father of Shechem, Hamor. So Hamor comes to him and says, hey, my son has on his wish list your daughter. And he told me to come get her. Actually, what you don't understand is she's actually still back there with Shechem. She's with him in his house. They do this so they have a bargaining chip. She didn't, they didn't let her return home. Which makes me wonder, maybe she didn't want to go home. 
which makes me think maybe it was somewhat consensual, or maybe she saw that her whole life was now lost because she's damaged goods and unmarriable as far as the culture is concerned. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field, and when they heard it, the men were grieved and very angry. Amen. It's about time somebody got angry. Because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. It's a good thing that they got angry. But you tend to find that young men don't think very often when they're angry. Have you seen it? Have you been there? I'm not even a young man, and I have to be careful because I can use my tongue like a sword, and I don't want to do that. But they were angry, and they should be angry. They should have, they've had a reaction much like their father should have, but he didn't. He just sits on his hands. And so the, the boys are now upset, and Jacob is the guy who's going to have to stand between them and Shechem and Hamor, who have come to negotiate. But Hamor spoke to them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife, and make marriages with us. Give us your daughters to us, and take our daughters to yourselves. Got 11 strapping lads here. We'll get you 11 brides. So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Wow. Let's have a merger. Let's put our people with your people, and we'll all be a great nation, and you can have all of our stuff and share in our wives, and we can have all of, well, they only had one to give, really, that we're aware of. The question is, why is he making such grand gestures? Could it be that Jacob has acres and acres and acres of animals and many, many sons and many, many things? Could it be that when he got there and he looked at the ranch, he said, it's pretty good living out here. In 1 Corinthians 7.39 it says this, a wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she's at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. Notice the last, only in the Lord. In other words, if my wife dies, I can feel free to marry somebody else, but not a non-believer. And so what he's proposing is, we're going to take your nation and our nation and become one nation. It'll be our nation. You think that's what the Lord wants? Of course not. He says, come out from them and be separate from them because they're all idol-worshiping people and their morals are shot, obviously. First time you lay eyes on a girl and you, you have sex with her. Not a good idea. Only in the Lord. And then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. Wow, that's a strong statement. Ask me, ask me ever so much dowry as a gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. I'll give you anything. That's pretty desperate, right? Now, either he loves this woman who he just met so incredibly deeply, which I doubt, or he's a passionate youth. You take your pick. But suddenly money comes into the picture. I'm willing to give you whatever you ask me. Hmm. Let me think. What could I possibly want? Let me ask something big. And by the way, the larger the dowry, the more valuable the prize. And so there were, there were men that were glad to give tremendous amounts of wealth to prove that they loved the person whom they're essentially buying and so that's the dowry. And now the boys have something else to think about, which they weren't thinking about it until this point. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. 
And they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. Well, they started off real well. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and you will take, uh, take your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. It's interesting that the sons say, we will take our daughter? Notice Jacob says nothing. The boys are speaking for the father. Don't let your children speak for you. <laughs> Pastor Dave will have to bring it up and point it out to you. They are speaking in place of the father because the father's saying nothing. Knowing something of Jacob's character, we understand what that is. Well, more on that in a little while. They said, we will come and take our daughter. In other words, she's not there. She's not present for this. She's back with Shechem. She's back in town. It's almost like a kidnapping. And they're negotiating. They say, well, listen, if you get circumcised like us, now, is that what the Lord would have them do? Because the circumcision would mean nothing. It's a sign of a covenant between God and the descendants of Abraham, not the descendants of Hamor. Being circumcised would mean nothing at all. It's like an unbeliever dropping a big giant check in the, in, into the, the offering. It's not going to count for much if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're going to stand before God and he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? You say, because I put that big check over at Grace Bible Fellowship. <laughs> he's going to say, yeah, but what about your sin? You were born a sinner and you've sinned 80 billion times. What do we do with that? You're going to ruin the neighborhood if I let you in up here. Oh, I didn't think about that. Nobody told me that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody told me I needed a savior. Nobody told me I needed to be forgiven. Well, I just told you. So I need somebody to take my place because the only way I'm going to pay for my sin is an eternity in a place called hell that Jesus came to deliver us from if we have faith in the finished work that he completed on the cross. He is our substitution, which is what we just remembered in communion. So they're holding Dinah hostage, if you will. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem. They were good to get religious. Hamor's son. So the young man did not delay to do the thing. And we don't know if he did it right then and there. He's a passionate guy. He may, he may have carried his pocket knife with him. Because he delighted in Jacob's daughter, and he was more honorable than all of the household of his father. Interesting comment in the scripture. He was more honorable than everyone in his family. This kid was willing to do anything to marry her. He had good intentions. He may not have initially, but he does now, and that's a good thing, isn't it? By the way, most men who rape women as soon as they're finished, they hate them. That's the psychology of rape. If you look at the rape of Tamar from Ammon, her, her brother actually, as soon as it was over, he hated her, wanted nothing to do with her. And she ple pleaded with him, please don't do this thing, please. Talk to dad, square it off. We're only half brother and sister. Maybe it could work out. She's like negotiating. It's in 1 Samuel. And it's, it's terrible to read. And so he has this deep love for her, which tells me there might have been something else going on here than just a non-consensual uh, rape. But he certainly violated her. He took something that wasn't his. And it's not a gift you can ever give back or give a second time. And so he says, let's go. Let's, let's do the deal. Let's make it happen. And it says that he was more honorable than all of the his household of his father. So let's, let's get busy. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us, therefore let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives, 
and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Now here's the sales pitch. Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? You see the motive? It's money. Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. For all who went out to the gate of the, hit, of the city, he did Hamor and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of the city. In other words, anyone who came up and was part of this negotiation and heard this announcement, everybody submitted to circumcision. Because what was in it for them? Stuff. We're going to get stuff, which is still why people marry one another. There are girls that are cruising every weekend and they see a handsome guy and say, hey, what's your name? What do you do? <laughs> what do you care what I do? Sorry. He gives them, this, he gives them the sales pitch and they accept. And so everybody lines up and gets ready to be circumcised. Every single male in the city gets the nip the tip. <laughs> now it came to pass, now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, by the way, they're her full brothers through Leah, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. You see, it was a ploy. I'm going to use religion as a cover-up for my sin. And they committed murder of an entire city. Two guys. Because none of the men could stand up straight to fight. And so they killed them all. Every man. That's not a solution. That's an overreaction. There's no heroes in this story. And they come and they take Dinah and they take her away. She's in his house at this point. Bound for the altar. And so they steal her back. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city. Now the other boys are involved. Because their sister had been defiled. And they took their sheep, their oxen, their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field. And all their wealth and their little ones and their wives they took captive. And they plundered even all that was in their houses. This is wrong. Went in and gutted the place, killed all the men and said, oh, we're going to share, we're going to share our wives and our daughter. Yeah, we're going to take them. And oh, we'll, our wealth will be common. Okay, no problem. We'll take you out and it'll be ours. Do you see what a deceitful thing this is? using religion as a cover-up and a setup so that they could murder the entire town, including Shechem. So how does that make Dinah feel? She met a handsome young man at the mall and thought she was going to get married, and what ends up happening is her brothers come in and kill him, probably right in front of her. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me, by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? And the question mark is left there dangling. There's no answer given. That's the end of the chapter and we begin a new topic next week. Strangely unsatisfying. I want you to notice something about Jacob. 
He doesn't mourn for the act of murder. He doesn't mourn for his daughter. He doesn't mourn that his sons are now murderers. He says, oh no, I'm in trouble. He's a classic narcissist. Take a look at it. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have, made, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites, and since I am few in number, wait a minute, he's only one person. Since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. Like, what about your kids? What about your wives? What about, it? it's all about you. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. You had to put another I in there. It's all about him. Oh my goodness. Could there be a more self-centered statement? You did what? Oh, everybody's going to be mad at me. They're going to come and find me. They're going to kill me. They're going to take everything that I own and all of my people. Get over yourself, man. Don't you... Where's the heart? Where's the morality? Where's the relationship with God? Where's the crying out to God? God, we've sinned. Please forgive us. Don't show retribution on us. And Jacob's one of God's kids. And the boys asked the question, should he treat our sister like a harlot? You think we were supposed to just let this go, dad? That's what he did. And he put it squarely in the hands of his sons. That's why I said, don't let your children rule your house. So that is the taking of Dinah. Which is something that never should have been done. God sequesters a sexual relationship for married couples husband and wife, for life. That's God's plan. Without it, there's all sorts of things that happen. There's a few things that I think we can get from this chapter, and I'm just going to go over them quickly. Being in a place that God has not led you has its consequences. Jacob was 50 miles shy of being where God told him to be. It's a very easy thing to get lost in life and lose the Lord. It's easy to know what God would have you do and take kind of plan B or take a side route. It's, it's okay. God understands. He loves me. There's grace and forgiveness. There are consequences to wrong choices. Inaction and lack of leadership leads to chaos. You see, because Jacob did not take charge of this thing, he didn't go before God with this thing. He didn't exercise judgment with this thing. And this lack of leadership made the chaos. It leaves a vacuum that has to be filled somehow. That's why his sons filled that vacuum. If he would have, take, if he would have taken charge, this wouldn't have happened. Curiosity and seeking fellowship with the world results in impurity. Can I get an amen? Amen. There are places I shouldn't go. There are people I shouldn't spend time with and there are things I should not do. It will cause me to lead an impure life and it will compromise my testimony about who I say Jesus is. Now, this is the guy that set up a pillar, right? He said, this is, this is the pillar. This is the God of Israel here. You know, I'm calling on him. I'm a religious guy. And that's his testimony. What do you think they all think now? Well, the guys are all dead. And they seem to have no problem taking all the women and children to themselves. Lust and entitlement will alienate others. When we sin against other people, we sin in a giant circle that you may not see. For me to cheat on my wife destroys my wife, it destroys me, it destroys whoever it is that I'm with. It affects their family. It affects the world. It affects this church. It affects everything in giant concentric circles that you just don't see. Lust and entitlement will alienate others and the circles get larger. Galatians 5, 16 to 26 says this, 
I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, or since we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. Amen. The scripture has an antidote from us falling into that sort of a category. And it's to walk in the spirit, to be led by God. Another lesson is deceitful scheming in the name of religion will ruin your testimony. If you think that you can call yourself one of God's kids and then live like one of the world, you're going to completely ruin other people's picture of who God is in your demonstration of godlessness, much like what happened here. In Proverbs 14, 12, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. If any of you have allowed your temper to overrun you, you know that that's true. It seemed right to the sons of Jacob that they should take retribution. And it wasn't just rescuing their sister. It was killing every single man and using this sacred symbol, which was supposed to be a covenant symbol between God's people and God. And he, they used it as a, a weapon to kill people. It's shameful. In Romans chapter 12, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We live according to the sayings of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Not by our own strength, by our own hand, even by our own judgment, because there's a way that might seem right, you know, somebody sticks their foot out and trips me and I fall to the ground and I think, well, apparently I need to break your head open <laughs> or put you in a deadly chokehold. It's a bit of an overreaction, isn't it? So I need to walk in the spirit and I need to not take vengeance for myself, but allow God, because he's got my back and allow him to take care of those things instead of us taking care of them. Amen? That's the taking of Dinah. Next week, going home. This devastating event makes Jacob afraid because he's very afraid. He didn't want to offend anybody. That's why he didn't react when his daughter was raped or assaulted. This thing has caused him to say, we better get out of here, guys because all the surrounding nations know what happened here. And so he finally goes back to Bethel. Next week will be a much more pleasant sermon. But I'd like you to consider Dinah. It doesn't say that she was pregnant. It doesn't say that she had a child. But imagine she did. Do you think her brothers would be very compassionate towards that child? Or her father would be very willing to have the descendants of Hamor and Shechem live among them. 
there are people who have made very bad decisions like Dinah who have gotten into places where they shouldn't have gotten to and they've listened to some sweet talk that some young man gave them and they find themselves pregnant with a baby. I would challenge you guys. It's one thing to say I'm against something and it's another thing to say this is the solution. We've had people in our lives that we've tried to ask them not to have an abortion, that we would help them, that they could come into our home, that we would pay for their medical bills, that we would feed them and care for them and love on them and disciple them. And they've turned their back and decided to do it anyway. And I can tell you it's a devastating event in anyone's life who's involved. And we have a ministry here that's local that intercedes on our behalf because we support them. I would encourage you to continue and also be willing to make a personal connection with somebody and be able to share the love of Jesus with them because that's really what they're looking for. It's a cheap substitute to get something from a young man that only Jesus can give. Father, I pray that you might help each one of us as we think about the story that we've heard. I pray that we might have your heart and we might have your mind on it. And I pray that you help each one of us, Lord, to have compassion and love for those who don't know any better or like Dinah, get themselves in trouble because they're just not walking wisely. I pray that you help us, Lord, to give you glory in all these things that you might help us to be your hands and your feet and your mouth and your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.